Hello and welcome to Sunshine for Your Life. A few years ago, one of my colleagues gave me a tiny seven-week-old kitten. This was during a chapel service. I had lost my previous cat. She had lived over 20 years, and she was a calico, and a beautiful uh, cat, and I really wanted to have another pet. I couldn't think of myself as not having a pet to, to be with me, so I, they gave me this, uh, this little tortoiseshell kitten and they didn't tell me they were going to give it to me but I had had uh, warnings in advance that somehow a kitten was going to show up and I didn't realize it was going to be in the middle of a chapel service but there I was I was ready to preach and this person approached me with a box and since it had an air hole in it I was rather suspicious that there might be a kitten in the box so I opened up the box and there she was my beautiful beautiful little tiny kitten she was very, very small. So before I go on with this, I'm going to show you some pictures of this cat. She was just so tiny. Let me just show you these pictures now. I have three or four. Uh, so you can get a chance to, to see the kitten I'm going to talk about. This is my mother. She is close to being 90 years old in this picture. And this is the little kitten in her lap. You can see by the size of her hand how small the kitten is because her whole hand covers the whole body of this little kitten. So this is the first picture. The second picture that I want to show you is, a, a, is actually is a picture. I um, uh, was holding the kitten. She was about seven weeks old when I had this picture taken. My mother was shooting the picture herself. I've drawn a little bit around it, but this is a tiny kitten. She's looking up at me, and you can see how tiny she is. Just the fact that my hand covers her entire body and the size of her tiny little paws. And so that is the second picture I'm going to show you of this kitten. And uh, this is the third picture uh, of her, and it is an actual photograph. I am holding her. My mother has shot the picture. She is seven weeks old. She is a tortoise shell, as you can see in there. There are various colors. She was just so extremely cute. I just couldn't understand how a kitten could be as cute as she was. And uh, here's a picture. Whoops. I'll take this one off. Here's another picture. Let me put this back on here. I took the picture and I whoops, drew it a little bit. Ah, good, thank you. That's great. At, you saw a picture of that, but what I did was I took that picture, I, I, I had it uh, blown up at a, at a photocopy uh, shop, and then I colored it in so you can see uh, clearly what this kitten looks like. She really was a wonderful cat. In this picture, she's a little older. But it is a good picture of her, and she looks like she's standing, but actually she's on the rug, and she is actually um, um, laying down, and then she lifted up her head to look at me, and I grabbed my camera, and I shot this picture. So although she looks like she's standing, she really isn't standing. So those are the pictures that I have that I want you to see of my kitten. This kitten... Uh, it was so small, she's a tortoise shell. And this kitten was so small, when I brought her home, or before I brought her home, I went to my veterinarian, who took care of all of my pets, and said that I was about to adopt a little kitten. So what he did, I hadn't gotten her yet, but what he did was he put her on a special baby diet for small kittens. And uh, he also gave me a water dish and a food dish for her, so I was really ready to have her come home. But when I I brought her home, she was so little, she was too small to lift her head over the water dish or over the food dish, so I ended up by using little saucers instead. So uh, when, I weigh, when the vet weighed her, she was too small to tip the scales. He'd put her on a scale and she didn't tip it. So what they had to do was get a special scale and it weighed in ounces, only in ounces, and then they got her weight. She wasn't two pounds yet. She was a little over one pound, so that she was very, very small. Uh, she, my kitten 
uh, adjusted quickly to our home and quickly took over the house as her main responsibility. I named her Melody Ruth. I named her that because I wanted her to have both a biblical and a musical name, so she became Melody Ruth. There was a kitten, another kitten in the same litter that I almost took home, but I didn't. I just took her. But I was going to name him Harmony Paul, so he would also have a, uh, a, a biblical and a musical name. But Melody Ruth is her name. And she, we called her a lot of other things. You know, I called her the world's most perfect kitten. My mother called her Melody Mayhem because she was an extremely active kitten. And I called her also my 16-ounce whirling dervish. If you could have seen the things that she did and what she got into once she got used to being there, and she kind of claimed ownership of the house, we were doing rescue missions all the time in order to take care of her. Melody was always a small cat, but she was extremely bright, extremely active, and she had a mind of her own. Now, I've done some research on tortoiseshells. Melody was a tortoiseshell kitten. They are related to the calicos. The calicos are the three colored cats, you see, sometimes called the bunny cats. But this one is a tortoiseshell, and a tortoiseshell cat is like, is kind of related to the calico cat, but instead of having blotches of color here and there, the colors are blended together, and so you get the, the, you get the three colors, but it's not so obvious where these colors are, and yet you do see them. If you get close enough to the cat, you can see she had streaks of yellow on her, but not just blotches. They just all blended in with brown and black and white, so she is a true tortoiseshell. Now, I've done some research on tortoiseshell kittens, on tortoiseshell cats. They are very, very intelligent. They have three characteristics. They are very, very intelligent. They are very independent, or at least they try to be very independent. What they want to do, they want to do, and they'll do it no matter what. And they bond very deeply to their owners. They are a one person, a one family cat. When you belong to them, you know, when you have a kitten you, uh, like that, a, a tortoiseshell kitten, it ends up that you belong to them. You are theirs. And there is a very close bonding between human and tortoiseshell cat. They're not so independent that they don't want you. People complain about cats in the sense that they're independent and they don't care if you're around or not. Not so with the tortoiseshell, and I found not so with most cats. They really want their people. They want them there with them. So the cats are very independent. The question is, how can somebody, or how can an animal be so independent and yet be so dependent on their owners for care? It's like a, a double-edged sword here. She's very independent, but she's very bonded and wants me with her all the time. Now, Melody was never a large cat. And the question is, when you have an independent cat and an active cat, the question is, who belongs to who? My cat was always a people owner. She owned us. That was her premise. We were hers. And so we thought she was ours. But you'll find if you have a pet, that's the way it is. Now, she was so small. She was never very large. She was always small. And that gave her the ability to get into places that we wish that she hadn't been. For example, the back of the refrigerator, it's hard to get her out. And in my file drawers, if I opened my file drawers, she'd crawl in. I had to be careful if I closed the file drawer that she wasn't snuggled in the back somewhere. Inside our organ, how does a cat get inside an organ? I didn't know she could till I saw her walk out of it. Then I realized that she went in and out of our organ. And she was so small, she kind of slithered, slithered her way on the foot pedals and got inside that way. So we had to start cat kitten proofing our house. And uh, we did kitten proof our house. So she wouldn't get stuck in places where it would be difficult for us to get her out. Uh, we 
we, it, I had to kitty-proof my office, too, because I had an office attached to my house, and I used to let her in there until I realized that when I was busy and she wanted my attention, she knew how to crawl under the desk and disconnect my answering service by pulling out the wires. So I knew that if I had a quiet day, something was wrong, and I'd have to crawl back under the desk and reconnect the answering service that she had disconnected. So I got a kick out of it, but I had to be, be wary of when she was allowed in my office. We didn't see eye to eye where she belonged. I thought she belonged by her food and water dishes on the couch, in my bed, by my bed, on her baby bed, playing with her toys, things that you would expect for a kitten. She thought that her place was anywhere she could squeeze in. And due to her small size, she could squeeze in a lot of places. I used to find her wanting to jump off the stairs that went to the second story, squeezing behind the bars of the banister or between the bars of the banister and sticking her little head out. And then I'd have to sit there until she dropped, raise up my hand, and catch her. She was small enough that she, I could hold her in the palm of my hand. So we decided we had to borrow the banisters. I had, I had cardboard that I had put up so she could not squeeze beside or between the banisters to jump off because I didn't want her getting hurt. So this is the thing that, about kittens. They rule. I actually thought she might be have a mental problem, so I had a consultation with my veterinarian and his staff, and I talked about all of the escapades she got into. Now, I, I'm not even beginning to tell you all the escapades she got into. I was rescuing her all the time. So I went to my vet, and I says, is she normal? Is there something wrong with her mentally? And I told of all the things that she was doing. After they stopped laughing and rolling on the floor because they, like, they were laughing so hard they almost couldn't stand it, they said, Pat, there is absolutely nothing wrong with your kitten. She's just a very, very active and very young kitten. And they all go through that stage. And my cat, I think, went through it double. But at any rate, she was all right. And I was glad because I didn't want to give her up. I fell in love with her when I first saw her. But she did have a way about her in terms of her independence and the things that she could do and the things that she could get behind and the trouble she could cause and moving my eyeglasses so she could lay on my face. Anything she could do, she's very, very smart, but that's the characteristic of the tortoiseshell cats. You know, most people don't realize that cats really are very, very intelligent, some more than others, but they're very intelligent. You are aware of a dog's intelligence because of the tricks that you can teach them, things like like that. The cats are very intelligent too in their own way. And when you have a pet, you have to get to know and care for that pet, know what it can do, know what makes it happy, and yet have enough control so that you're not being run over by your pet all the time. So we know that Melody had a place. And I, this is what I'm segueing into. You have a place too. Everybody has a place. Everybody belongs somewhere. There is a place for you, and that place is important. And as a Christian, God God opens up opportunities for you that match your abilities so that you can have success. We often think, well, I'd like to do this, or I'd like to do that, or I'd like to start a ministry. God has it all prepared for you, what he wants you to do, and he's prepared something for you to do that's going to be in line with your abilities. And what you lack in terms of training, he provides that training for you. That's why I have three college degrees. That's why I was trained as a minister, and I'm ordained as a minister. I went to school for many, many years, and I don't regret it one bit, the thing I've been able to do with my education. Uh, if I hadn't had that education, I would not have been able to accomplish the things that I've been able to accomplish. So, of course, you're going to have some struggles and you're going to have some opposition, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go ahead and do what you know for sure God has called you to do. Because as a Christian, God has called you to something. We've all been called to something. And, and we have been called 
through our difficulties, through our, schedules, our struggles, and God will lead us on the way in terms of what he wants us to do. You need to be sure that what you're doing is what he wants. And then when you're sure that what you're doing is what he wants, and that's been confirmed by you, and that's been confirmed by God, and you absolutely know you're on the right track, then don't give it up. If you have problems, God's going to get you through those problems. You as a Christian have been called because all Christians have been called. So I'm going to read a scripture here, John 15, 16, and I'm reading it from the NIRV version, which is a version that's related to the NIV version, but a little bit different, but still the same company puts it out. So John 15, 16, this is what it says. You did not choose me. Instead, I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit. It is fruit that will last. I'm going to read this again. You did not choose me. Instead, I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit. It is fruit that will last. Now, the King James says it differently, and I'm not going to actually read the verse, but make reference to it. The King James Version says that we have been ordained by him to do our work and that, that our work will last so that what we do will last, but we have been ordained to do it. That's the way the King James puts it. Other versions say we have been appointed to do our work. It all means about the same thing. Whatever version of the Bible that you have, if it's a good version, it, it will all say and mean the same thing, but be phrased differently according to what the writer wants because it may be easier to understand in one version than another, which is why I often use the NIA RV or the NIV Bible, but it means the same thing. Whatever version that you have, you have been appointed or ordained or chosen to do a certain kind of work. God has called you to it, and since he has called you to it, you need to do it, and he will back you up in it. Now, believers have always been called, and in history, they recognized and accepted their call, even if they didn't understand what was going on, even if they didn't understand the context of what they were doing and the reason they were doing it. We often don't understand what's going on in life. We don't understand our full purpose. We don't understand the full effects of our ministries if we have ministries. Or if you're taking care of children, who knows what they're going to become. It'll be basically as a result of how you've trained them, but who knows exactly what's going on in life. So I want to read another verse here. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. And I am again reading it from the NIRV version. And this is what it says. Now we see only a dim likeness of things. It is as if we were seeing them in a mirror. Someday we will see clearly. Now let me read that again. Now we see only a dim likeness of things. It is as if we were seeing them in a mirror. Someday we will see clearly. Now this won't be on the screen, but it goes on from there because I didn't read the whole thing. What I know now is not complete, but someday I will know completely just as God knows me completely. And I'll read that again. What I now know is not complete, but someday I will know completely just as God knows Knows me completely. So that verse says a couple of things that I think we have to remember that's important. One, we don't know the full picture. The picture is much larger than we can imagine. If you're doing a work of God, it fits into a much bigger picture, but you don't necessarily know what that picture is. You see a part of it. You don't see the fullness of it. Only God can see the fullness of it. But someday, when we are in heaven, or someday as we mature more, we will see more and more and more of what that picture entails that we don't see now. But we're never going to see perfectly what goes on and what God is doing in our lives and the effects it has on other people until we get beyond and we're able to see when that's revealed to us. But there is a bigger picture, and someday we will see it, and we will see it much more completely. And then the verse also states, of course, that I don't know God completely. I don't see the big picture, but God knows me, and he knows me completely, and he does, because after all, he has all knowledge. He knows when you stand up 
Psalm 139 says he knows when you sit down, he knows where you're going, he knows every thought, everything that is, has anything to do with you, he knows about you completely. You are fully known. Every hair on your head is counted, and the Bible says that he knows how many hairs are on your head, and God knows your every thought, and he knows when you sit and he knows when you stand, he knows when you travel, he knows everything about you. So you don't see everything, but he knows and sees everything. Nothing is going to happen to you that God does not already know about. And remember that God is going to bless the lives of other people through you. If you are doing things for God, you can't see the results necessarily, but, but they will, uh, God will bless other people and he'll bless them through the work that you have done. He gets the credit, you get the rewards, and people get the blessings that God has planned for them to have. The danger is that you're going to quit, that you're going to run into some kind of an obstacle and you're going to say, well, this is it. I've had it. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm too tired. I'm too old. I'm too weak. I'm too sick or whatever it is. I just won't put up with these things anymore. And what's going to happen is you would lose your reward because God has it all planned for you. But the people that you were supposed to help will not get the benefits of your help. And that means God has to do something else. He has to choose a different way to meet their needs when his plan was to meet their needs through you. So it's a serious thing to back off and not continue with what you've been chosen to do. This is something that God wants you to do. He has gifted you for it. He has chosen you for it. And it's something you really need to keep up. You should never back off. God will bless you and the God will bless the lives of others through you. And you will be a difference in somebody's life and the lives of others will be affected for good in a way that you can't even imagine because God is using you and you don't see the results of that. It's like you throw a rock in a pond. What happens? You see the ripples. You see the ripples around the rock and then they spread out and they spread out and they spread out and they spread out. Who knows where they end? It depends upon what the depth of the splash was to begin with, but it keeps on going on and on and on and that means that you have to go where God calls you and you have to do what God wants you to do in order to have the effects on people that you need to have. Uh, I'm going to read another verse and this is Ephesians 2.10 and it says this and I'm reading it from the NIRV. This is what it says. God made us, he created us to belong to Christ Jesus. Now we can do good things long ago that God prepared for us to do. Let me read that again. God made us, he created us to belong to Christ Jesus. Now we can do good things. Long ago, God prepared them for us to do. So God knew long ago what he wanted us to do, and he's prepared those works for us to do long before we were even on the earth. You are alive, you are breathing, God created you, and there is a relationship between you and God. Now you need to do his work. You have a place, and it's important, so you need to complete what he wants you to do. We're running out of time, so I'm going to close it here. We'll be doing something else next time. Please join me then.